And we're back. It's a Monday edition here on the Stripe Show podcast. I'm your host, Travis Fulton. Thank you for making us part of your day. Stripe Show podcast brought to you by Encore Golf. It's going to be another good week of golf as we look ahead to the Bermuda Championship. We'll, we'll get to that field. Not a great field, but a field nonetheless. We'll break that down later in the week, as we always do from a fantasy golf perspective. This week, it's going to be on a Wednesday, not Tuesday. Tomorrow on Tuesday, Sam Ryder will join Froggy. We're going to switch things around. And then I got a special guest for you on Wednesday, Rob Bolton, who I used to work with at PGATour.com. He's going to come in and shed some light on some names that you probably haven't known a lot about that's in the field this week in Bermuda. But first, it's Monday. And a good friend is joining me, Damon Hack, with the Golf Channel, co-host of Golf Today. How you doing, buddy? Travis, I'm great. I, I love the Seahawks outfit that you're you're rocking. You got a big game coming up, and uh, I'm actually sitting in Mike Tarico's makeup room. So uh, I'm here at NBC in Stanford. Hopefully, he doesn't come uh-huh. in and and you know knock on the door. But I think I think we're good to go, buddy. <laughs> well, yeah, I've got my gear on. You know, it's um, we're running out of time. You know, we're two and four. Russ is hurt. I oh. never thought I would see Damon, uh, Gino, right? Our quarterback, Gino versus Jameis <laughs> tonight <laughs> on Monday Night Football. I never thought I'd see. I never thought I'd see Russ hurt. I mean, the guy's, yeah. I mean, absolutely durable. But and it's a finger, nonetheless. I mean, it's like it's yeah. like right here. It's not a knee or an elbow. Or it's it's a finger. He can't grip it. But nonetheless, we've got Gino. They got Jameis. I don't know. We're 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 a four point dog at home. We haven't been a four point dog at home in a long time. I'm not I fun. like the I'm not Seah- I like the Hawks. I mean, call me crazy, but you still got DK and you got Lockett. I, I think Gino, to me, has performed better than maybe some would have expected, considering his time with the the Jets and the Giants. I think sitting as a bit of an understudy to Russell Wilson these last couple of years, I, I think he looks good to me. He actually yeah. looked like he he can handle run the offense, and I think they're. I think they might be in a good position to do something special today. That's my. I opinion. hope so. Yeah, it's desperation time. We got to win because you know the Cardinals are undefeated, seven and zero. The Rams are tough, six and yeah. one. The Niners are fading, a lot of injuries. So we've got to win this game to even just keep our head above water. But enough with football. We'll get to that tonight. Let's talk a little golf. Hideki Matsuyama gets his seventh win. That's seven now uh, on the PGA Tour. Granted, you know a little bit of a softer field, uh, not as many over there. In Japan, but nonetheless, Damon Hideki goes over to Japan and he wins. Of course, he wins the Masters early in the year. You've been in the media a long time. I want to start the podcast by asking you this: You've seen the Japanese media, you've seen the pressure um, that is put on Hideki as the guy representing Japan. Give us some insight to how that dynamic is, and 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 what you know about Hideki. You know, I don't really know him that well. You've spent some time with him. Give us some insight on the man that is Hideki Matsuyama as well. Yeah, it's a great question because this is someone to me who faces the a similar media scrutiny that Tiger Woods does, but he gets it from his entire country in Japan. In many ways, he's the Tiger of Japan. And speaking of Tiger, Travis, a few years ago, I covered the Hero World Challenge in the Bahamas, which is like an end of the year it's not necessarily a hit and giggle, but you know, there's no cut. Field of like 18 to 20 players, pretty loosey goosey. And Hideki played, and, and Hideki eventually won the golf tournament. But what stood out to me was that after every round, Hideki would go to the practice green by himself. Most of the players aren't grinding at the Hero World Challenge. They might be working on a few things, trying some equipment, but Hideki was putting uh, for nearly an hour after every round. And, and who would you see? on the outskirts of the putting green was the Japanese media watching him, watching his every move, waiting to talk to him. And this is someone like, like Tiger, who, whether you shoot 65 or 80, the media wants to talk to him. There's the television cameras. There's the still photographers. There's the radio reporters. There's the newspaper reporters and newspapers. You know, while they may not be as big as they were in the United States, they're still pretty big in Japan. So he goes through a battery of interviews after every single round. Even in December, we're talking dozens of reporters waiting to talk to a player who right now arguably is the greatest golfer ever from that nation. It is a sports crazed nation. It is a golf crazed nation. Hideki Matsuyama handles it with a bomb to handle the pressure of being the first you know, 
you know, man from Japan to win the Masters, mm-hmm. to win uh, a major championship, and, and to carry that pressure on his shoulders after that Saturday 65 to get it done on Sunday. Then you go to the Olympics, and it doesn't quite go the way you want. You lose in the bronze medal playoff, and then you go back to Japan at the end of what's already been an emotional year, and you win the Zozo. It speaks a lot to the quality and the toughness of this player. You know, they could all play on the PGA Tour. We know that some have higher skill sets than others. But when you put the pressure on them, you know, then it gets whittled down even more. Hideki's always come across to me as someone who, you know what, put the pressure on me. I can handle it. You know, he handles it extremely well, obviously winning the Masters. But you look at him, you know, he's won Memorial. He's got a couple WGCs to his name. He's won Waste Management twice. Now the Zozo, and of course, coming after the disappointment, as you mentioned, going over there and not meddling in uh, in the Olympics. I'm sure he was disappointed by that, as the country was. But then you go back, and now it's the Zozo. He finished second there in 2019 to Tiger. He goes back and not only wins, but he blitzed the field. He wins by five. Dominant. A lot of pressure. Sign me up. Decky can handle it. Yeah, he eagled that final hole for that five shot cushion absolutely striped his, you know, on the stripe show pod striped his approach. Uh, he's a wonderful long iron player, hybrid player, fairway yeah. wood player. And, and to see him hit that shot, he was walking after as much as Hideki, you know, is pretty steady. Not much of a guy who emotes as much, except when he hits a poor shot or which is his mind, a poor shot, which is 15, 20 feet, maybe left or right of where he's looking. And he'll sometimes drop the club, but on this, this approach shot into 18, he was like, eyes wide open, fired up, kind of walking after it a little bit. Um, This is someone who, to me, has a great blend of humility, but also toughness. Uh, He's a big, solid human being also. I've been in the gym with him uh, at a courtyard Marriott. I can't remember what tournament it was, but he was in the gym at the same time that I was. He is a big, strong man, a a modern player that he hits the ball a long way. And when the putter cooperates, you find himself – uh, on leaderboards and winning golf tournaments and winning by five. But to think that he said his game was a one out of 10 coming in to the Zozo championship. And then he goes and, and wins it. And, you know, listen, you had, you had Morikawa there and you had Xander Shoffley, you had Tommy Fleetwood there, Ricky Fowler, who was resurgent and of course, and played very well in Vegas. So to, to put all that aside, beat a, a, a strong field, relatively strong field, no cut event, you know, not a yeah. major obviously, but to beat some quality players in your home country after what's been a year of incredible change, emotion, you know, mm-hmm. life changing win the masters and money and attention and to find a way to kind of put all that side. So, you know, I'm still hungry to do great things uh, speaks to the quality of, of the player and the person. It's kind of a decky though. I mean, he kind of does go away and then he shows up yeah. and you know, his game, I've been telling people for like the, the modern game, you have to ball strike your way it, to get yourself opportunities. Hideki can do that. His putting can be obviously the liability. He's, I think he's only finished this year, positive strokes gained putting. I got it right here five times coming into this tournament. Wow. You know, wow. so his putter, he's always losing strokes. Um, he lost nine and a half at the CJ Cup mm. uh, before the Zozo, 67th at the Shriners, 59th at CJ. But then there he goes. He has a good putting week and. He wins. And that's kind of how Hideki does it. When the putter shows up like it did at the Masters, um, you know, like it did at some of these WGCs, you go back to Houston Open where he finished second, positive 4.5. When he gets into that positive 3, 4, 5, he's usually right there on the first page of the leaderboard because he drives it well. And he's a good iron player. He's, I think, one of the more underrated short game players Mm. on the PGA Tour. And speaking of his of his golf swing. We're going to go old school here for a minute, Damon, back to our old Orlando days uh, in the studio at golf channel. So you're going to throw it to me. Okay. And I'm going to, I'm going to give our audience cause they like the inside the ropes of, of what is Hideki working on and what do you notice about his swing? So Damon, throw it to me. I'm going to give it a little D I'm going to give it a little Hideki swing breakdown and then off Perfect. we go. All right. Hideki Matsuyama, winner of the Zozo Championship in his native Japan. How did he get it done? What's new with his golf swing? For more, we send it over to Travis Fulton. Well, you know, Hideki, you may have noticed his swing. He doesn't have that pause anymore, right? It's kind of gone away. Right. He goes up there and it's down. And I think he's doing that. I don't know this for sure, 
but I think he's doing it for speed. I think he's trying to pick up the pace going back and then coming through. That deliberate with the pause is definitely not the most efficient way to maximize speed. So I think he's trying to like speed up the backswing, smooth that out from a distance standpoint. And clearly it didn't mess anything up because he was able to keep it done. The other thing about Hideki, Damon, is his grip. It's a weak grip. His left hand is as weak as it gets. Okay, It's not yeah. like, like Calvin Pete used to be, which was way over or weak. But it's weak. Now, when you see that grip, he takes it back, and you're going to see that wrist flatten out. You know, if you see a player with a weak grip and then it's cupped, they're not going to be playing on TV. So with that weak grip, you're going to see a pretty flat left wrist. But I think the really interesting thing about his swing is he'll get it a little laid off. It'll point left. And I think he works on that because there's times it looks really good, and then sometimes it's pointing way left. Mm but he doesn't steepen it coming down, you know, like, like Ricky does. Ricky will point it left, and then it'll steepen in transition. Hideki keeps it kind of on that angle like John Rahm, and then he is just as clean as can be through the impact zone mm-hmm. with minimal shaft lean and then turning that face down. Oftentimes when you see that weak grip and you see that flat left wrist, that face will kind of hang just a bit open or not – open open but more open say relative to some of the other players like we see with dj jordan spieth rom who get it shut that face will hang a bit more open and he's able still to square it and he kind of gets that minimal shaft lean and that's how he, he can hit it straight up into the mm. stratosphere so it's fun to watch i think it's one of the main reasons why he won um at uh, at augusta and clearly uh, one of the real assets of his game. It's fascinating. He's got seven wins now, and he's only 29 years of age. We'll watch out for Hideki once we turn the corner as he defends at the Masters in what is now only six months away. Amazing. I love I love that swing breakdown. I love the the comparisons to other players. To me, he's a bit of VJ in that oh. uh, another Masters champ who doesn't putt that great all the yeah. time. I mean, you know, VJ was tinkering all the time with his putter. Uh, Hideki works overtime with his putter. VJ, one of the best ball strikers of, of our era, the, one of the hardest workers of the last 25 years. I think Hideki has a lot of VJ yeah. uh, in him right down to the occasional, you know, fits of peak with the putter. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I like that. You'd rather be a great ball striker than a great putter mm. all day long on the PGA mm. Tour. Just let me have my weeks like Hideki. Yeah, Just let me have I my weeks. You're right, 100%. All right, let's move on. I want to ask you about Rory. I talk about Rory a lot, A, because I love the guy, and B, he's just very fascinating to me. You know, the the person Rory is, the player Rory is. Of course, he won the week before. We mentioned the CJ Cup, 2,500 at the Summit Club. Uh, he won earlier at Wells Fargo. He's eighth in the World Golf Rankings now, 20 wins, four majors. It's interesting, though. I You know, I watch Rory. And I look at that win, and he wins with his driver and his putter, right? His driver was solid, but his putter, Damon, all of a sudden, is like dominant. Like the guy over the last five tournaments now has really figured out how to putt. We're talking positive three, four, five, six, pretty consistently here, working with Brad Faxon. Iron game, not so much. He wins even though he loses negative three and a half in approach, which is unheard of, man, I I just, I look at Rory and I want to ask you, what do you think of Rory's year first off? And then what do you think we're going to see from Rory again, as we turn the page to the masters, the one that is eluding him. What do you think? Yeah. Rory uh, continues to fascinate, intrigue. He's one of the most open vulnerable superstars that I've ever covered. And I've covered the NBA and the NFL in addition to golf. And I think looking at Rory's year, I I go right to that Ryder cup and and that Saturday night where he was apparently ready to just say, I'm done for the year. Uh, And he finds out that Patrick Harrington, I think Kyle Porter did some great reporting on it, that Patty wants to send him out first, even though he hadn't delivered a point for Europe and he goes out Mm -hmm. first and beats Xander and he's crying about the incredible show of faith that his captain and his players, teammates, peers had in him that Rory McIlroy is not supposed to go out 11th or go out eight. Rory McIlroy goes out first 
or he goes out last because he's going to be, you know, if it's a closer Ryder Cup, you want that anchor. And if it's a, if you need a hot start, you're going to put out, you know, one of the best players of this generation. So I almost feel like Rory needed to hit kind of rock bottom. Mm. It's interesting. After he won at Quail Hollow, I saw, you know, he's been working with Pete Cowan um, off and on over the summer. And I saw Pete and I, and I said, hey, congrats on the win. And he said, you know what, that kind of was the placebo effect. We had been just working together for a few weeks and talking philosophy. You know, the, the real test of whether Rory is comfortable with his golf swing will come at a PGA or uh, an Augusta National uh, you know, Masters or a U.S. Open at an Open at a major championship. That's when we'll know the trust that Rory McIlroy has in his swing and his game. And, and I think that really this is one of the great drivers that we've ever seen. Yeah. Someone who, for whatever reason, was chasing distance and trying to follow Bryson DeChambeau when – you know, Roy McIlroy doesn't follow anybody, doesn't need to follow anybody with the skill set that he has, especially off the tee. But I almost feel like that Ryder Cup moment was a cleansing moment for him to remind himself who he was, how much he loves golf, how much he loves the game and still needs the game, even as his life evolves and changes and he's married and with a child and more money than he knows what to do with finding motivation, finding your place when you are such a vulnerable person, a deep thinker who likes things outside of golf and trying to be a killer inside the ropes. That's, that's a, that's yeah. a hard thing to do. And I think he's still figuring that out. And I think that what we saw in Vegas was the fact that this is a player who still can be reckoned with. Hmm. And when things are right, you know, for him mentally, uh, he's as good as there is in golf. Yeah, he is. And you go back to that Wells Fargo and he had a stretch there of really probably five or six tournaments and, Three of those were major championships, and his irons were really good. He hit the ball yeah. nice. And then late summer, not so much, but the putter now has become a real weapon. So it's interesting. I mean, he, if he can turn the approach game, if he gets this where it's the approach and the putting, I mean, he's he's dominant. I mean, yeah. that, that A game, there is – I don't know if there's anybody that can play with that. I mean, certainly Rom could, would have something to say, and I would think DJ as well as A game. But that's certainly it for me. I mean, he, I heard him say, quote, he, you know, he's got to be – talk about his true self, right, and mm -hmm. being his true self. And I was surprised when he chased distance. I was yeah. really surprised. Not Rory. Not like if Rory. Anybody's, and, not Rory. And he told us. And then he told us. He, I'm so thankful he's so honest. Not only was he chasing distance, but then he told us, yeah, I was influenced by what – Bryson has been doing and kind of looking at the future and wondering, wow, is this what I'm going to have to do to, to hang? It's like, dude, you've won majors by eight shots. You know, you ran away with the Canadian Open. You won the players. You won two FedEx Cups. You know, there, there's teachers all over the world that have Rory McIlroy's golf swing in their lineup of of swings just to show their students about look 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 at the beauty of this. It's like a Davis Love who is at the height of his power, that that incredible width and flexibility. I mean, Rory is yeah. a swing that, you know, not many of us, if any of us can, can copy and emulate, but we watch it to appreciate it. And to hear that he was putting his swing under repair, uh, it, it kind of hurt, hurt my heart just as a yeah. fan of the game and a fan of what he does so well. But it's so nice to see the putter behave and to see his body language when he's in the mix playing well. Russell Knox has said that he has one of the best walks in golf. Is he does. When Rory is right. He's bouncing along the fairways. He's confident. He's engaged. And it's just – that's the Rory that uh, that we pay money to see. Absolutely. I, you know, obviously COVID didn't hit at the right time for Rory. Rory was the most dominant player when COVID hit. You go yeah. back to when things happened there in 2020 uh, after the Arnold Palmer – we're talking he won the tour championship before that, third at Zozo, then he wins WGC, and he's just ripping off thirds and fourth. I mean, just every week he was top yeah. five. And then he comes back, and the first tournament back was Charles Schwab, and I was told by some people that were there, they played a practice round with Bryson, and Bryson's hitting at 35 past him. And that didn't sit well. Mm. You know, all of a sudden, Bryson's 35, 40 past him, and that kind of got it started, and then he, I don't think he could get the motivation going, no fans, he admitted that. Right. Um, but now it's like, Rory, you're good enough. It's it's good enough. I don't care if Bryson's 25 past you. Like, it's it's good enough, especially with the putter behaving like that. All right, let's move. Let's look ahead here. 2022 20, season, right? Things are winding down in the fall. We got a few events left. But we're going to kick this thing back off again in January. Better season. Better season coming up 2022. 
good friends, JT or Spieth? Who has the better year? Whew. That is a great question. I, I think I think Justin Thomas does. I, okay. I, I feel like with a new caddy, and it's just this is, you know, Jimmy Johnson's a tremendous caddy, fantastic caddy. Sometimes you just need some new energy beside you. Uh, the fact that he has Bones, who's been there and done that, uh, an aggressive caddy, one who was with Phil for so many years in every situation. I, I think JT, even off of a year where he won the Players' Championship, would tell you that it was a disappointing year, that he did not lack consistency or he didn't have any consistency. Uh, he was yep. inconsistent, especially in the major championships, which is what he wants to so desperately add to the – PGA that he has from Quail Hollow in 2017. I feel like JT, um, and he kind of teases himself about the fact that he was like a world number one for like a handful of weeks. He's like, I had a cup of coffee with the world number one. Like he, he, he holds himself to an incredibly high standard. I think Jordan, as well as he played in this comeback year, I still think there are some – Okay. Some weeks where the swing is, is not quite where he wants it to be. And I just think that Justin has more firepower week to week. Uh, he hits the ball so high, can really get his wedges going. We've seen him hole out in Mexico and shoot 59. It's Sony and shoot 63 in a U.S. Open. I just think that in this era of golf, in the modern game where length is so important that I think week to week that JT's game still fits this era of golf a little bit better. Uh, I expect both to win this season. Yeah, but I think JT. I'm going to give JT a slight edge. Yeah, and that's that's well stated and fair. Yeah. I think the only probably big question mark for JT is that is is the putter. He's become yeah. wildly inconsistent with the yeah. putter, and I just it's interesting to me why these guys feel the need to change. We talked about Rory chasing distance and this mm. and that. For JT, it was the flat stick. Yeah. You know, he worked with Matt Killen for a long time with this putter rolling nicely. They he kind of moved on, did something different. And, you know, it just hadn't been the same. You know, he's you know, and it's like it almost looks like a starting line issue. Like he just can't get the ball to start on the line. Mm. And when you start getting to that point, man, you know, you're getting some bad, bad red numbers, which he did much mm. of this year. And as you know, that leaks into the rest of the game. And I think we saw that a little bit with JT. So it'll be fascinating. It's great to have Spieth back though, playing well. Of course he won last year as well. All right. Here's one that's in, really interesting to me. Sam Burns or Scotty Scheffler, bigger season next year. Ooh, I love that. You know what? I, I've been on golf today talking about Sam Burns and singing his praises. So I'm just going to ride out uh, the horse from, from LSU who, uh, you know, by all means and rights could have been on that Ryder Cup team, either beside or in place of Scotty Scheffler. I think both had fantastic years. Sam Burns, and you mentioned putting. To me, the fact that he hits the ball as well as he does yeah. and putts as well as he does is the reason. There was a, a Corn Ferry Tour guy on No Laying Up, uh, Justin Huber, was talking about the quality of the strike of, of Sam Burns's putter and that he watched Sam putt over bumpy greens one week on the Corn Ferry Tour. It was rainy. And he said every single putt was perfect speed. And it was either going in the hole or it was a foot pass to the point that Justin decided to have a club manufacturer make the exact same putter that Sam used. And he got the club, and he couldn't, he wasn't making putts like Sam. He's like, this isn't a putter thing. This is a Sam Burns thing. So yeah. to hear one of his peers des describe the quality of his putting stroke and to, to see how well Sam hits the golf ball, it's like, man – the combination is really, really special to be able to hit the ball as well as he does, as far yeah. as high as he does, and then to roll the rock as well as Sam Burns does. I'm giving a slight edge to Sam. Yeah, yeah, I tend to agree with that. I, I thought Burns should have been picked over Scheffler. Of course, mm. Scheffler played well mm -hmm. um, on the Ryder Cup and in particularly the last day beating. He actually played the last nine very well on Saturday, and then he played very well against John Rahm, who was probably yes. a little bit gassed and seeing exactly. he was carrying the entire shoulders. team on his shoulders at that point. <laughs> um, Burns the real deal. I've been saying it for a long time since he come out. I've known his coach, Brad Pone, for a while, and this kid's phenomenal. The guy that used to play with him in Louisiana when he was growing up. Mm. So one time they went out there and played, and he just got out of his car, and they were, yep, yeah, you want to hit him? He's like, oh, no, I'm good, let's go. So he gets up to the number one team. He kind of snipes one left, and it's kind of over in the trees. They're like, just hit another one. You have any more? He's like, no, I'm good. We'll find it. Went up there, 
hacked it out, hit his wedge to about two feet, made putt, and then he made <laughs> nine birdies after that and shot, you know, just like, <laughs> he was like, man, from the tips, like this kid is unbelievable and tough. And I, you know, I think Billy Horsha, who played with him at Zurich, and Sam like carried Billy, I think that, that tournament, and I think they finished second, um, was like, man, this kid is intense and tough. And I mean, he's just, he's a dog. I love him. I think Sam Burns uh, is the kind of kid that, um, you know, he gets a short game a little bit better. I think he could win a major championship. His short game gets a little clunky, mm. but I think he has the rest of it elite status. Long off the tee, great iron player, great putter. Get the short game better. I think he competes for a major. All right. They only get easier from here. John Rahm versus Colin Morikawa. Oh, gosh. <laughs> wow. Uh, that is – you know what? I'll say this. I, I walked away from the Ryder Cup, and I was there um, for Golf Channel, and I was like, oh, my gosh. Like, to me, John Rahm, we've just seen him with 23 of the other best players in the game, and to me, John Rahm looked head and shoulders yeah. the, the best player in the world, and that's – DJ going undefeated and Colin hitting incredible shots. I just was like, John Rom looks to me like the best player in the world. So I think he's worn down at the end of the year. You mentioned losing to Scheffler in singles, and he kind of carried a little malaise in Spain, uh, missed the cut at Valderrama. And I think it's just fatigue. He said he didn't want to see his golf clubs for three right. weeks to a month, and I think that's fine. I think when the when it's time to answer the bell in 2022 that, that John Rom is going to be given – his peers, everything they can handle. I love Colin Morikawa's iron game. I yeah. love his precociousness to, that he can show up at golf courses he's never seen and win a an Open or win a PGA. But I think that, and again, kind of in this modern era, that the length of of, of uh, off the tee and just the entirety of John Rahm's game, it, it's hard to find a hole in John Rahm's game. I, I just don't see one. If anything, if people say it's his temper, but I think he's worked on that. I think he's just fiery. He's learned to hit a bad shot and not carrying it on to the next hole or the next swing. I think John Rahm's going to be a tough out in 2022. Yeah, I do. I do too. It's funny. You can look at the official world golf rankings and you can find, well, there's like a weakness there in every player except mm. Rahm. I mean, yeah, to me, Rahm, the word is complete. I mean, he's just all 14 clubs. It's, it's Oof. top shelf. Um, it, he's going to be there and especially, you know, he, 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 like you said, he's just been gassed, you know, down the stretch here. And even like, you know, you look at Morikawa, the putter can be inconsistent. He's kind of that, I don't want to say modern game player, but there's so many like it that T to green, they're going to wear you out and they're just going to wait till that putter shows up. And when it does, they're going to win. And, and we've seen Morikawa do that. You know, DJ can get a little bit clunky, you know, from time to time with, certain parts of his game, um, you know, Bryson can get clunky with the approach game and the wedge game. Like, so you can just kind of go down the list and it's, but with Rom, it's like, dude's complete. And yeah. um, I, I think he, I think he's going to win. I, I think you're seeing three or four wins next year. Yeah. And I think he's rolling into his prime right now. And it's like, and he knows he's the best player. He knows. I agree. I, that's what I took away from there. I was up there. I was like, that guy's head and shoulders best player in the world. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't believe it. I was like, wow. And I, I learned more about him with the way he handled that memorial, losing that six-shot lead, and then coming back a couple weeks later to win the U.S. Open. People were wondering, where's his maturity level? I mean, he's a father now. I, he's the husband. He just – to handle that, that story transcended the game. I had, like, loose golf fans that kind of – Pay attention to the majors. They they knew the storyline of the six shot lead and you know testing yep. positive for COVID and they're like wow that that that's a very very cool story and a lesson for us all. Yeah, he's growing up literally before our eyes. Yeah. We can you can you can see it. You know, you look at the USA. Let me ask you this: USA has eight of the top eleven in the official World Golf Rankings. They were dominant in the Ryder Cup. You could kind of I don't know. At least I, I felt like the the, the U.S. was going to come out new era new chapter and they were going to put it on them. Like I just, I didn't think they were going to get to 20, but I, I thought they were no question going to come out and win. Um, you look at the European team, a lot of these top players are getting older. It's going to be now a little bit of a new generation for them, but where does it come from with these guys, you know, the Guidos and guys that are going to have to step up now into the role that Ian and Lee and these guys have had for so long. 
I look at it, Damon, I think for the next 48 years, the President's Cup mm. could be the bigger challenge then the Ryder Cup, and I know my audience from Europe right now is like, come on, pump the brakes. You win one. You're going to come over here, and you're going to get waxed like you always do. And what do you think? I mean, how do you, how do you view that for the next four to eight years? Which, what, what is it going to be? I'll tell you what it's going to be. The United States has to win on foreign soil first before, before I, <laughs> I go down that road. 1993 is a long time ago. Yeah. And, and and I think as dominant as a 199 victory was, and yes, Europe has some questions to answer with Casey and Westwood and Poulter, you know, deep in their 40s and, you know, even Sergio in his 40s. It's going to take some new faces. And for a long time, we've seen Europe find that guy, whether it's going to be a Thomas Peters or a Dubisson, even if it's a one off, a Jamie Donaldson, you know, knocking out Keegan Bradley. They've seemed to have been able to find someone to plug in. Nicholas Colsart's making a zillion birdies uh, that day against Tiger and Stricker. Uh, but I think it's a fair question to ask just because of this changeover feel um, when we walked away from Kohler. But if we know nothing from Paris, you know, Glen Eagles, you know, go back to Valderrama, K Club, you know, pick your road, Ryder Cup since the 90s. We have, yeah. you know, you've seen the Americans do pretty well at, at home for the most part, and then fumble it on the on the one yard line and <laughs> on European soil. So, I don't know much about Marco Simone in uh, in Rome, other than it's supposed to be like ten miles from the city center, which is going to be great for a lot of the media folks looking for a great meal. But uh, until I see the Americans win on European soil, I'm not ready to go down that road. That said, I do think that the Presidents Cup with the likes of Sunjay and Abe answer. Yeah. Derek Higo. I mean, I, I do think that they're they're going to be a tough out and they're getting better and better, and that gap is closing. But it is. As much as the Americans want to celebrate Kohler, they got to get it done on the road. <laughs> <laughs> kind of reminds me of that's a good point. It reminds me of when the Saints won the Super Bowl and the next year they're in the playoffs and they got to come to Seattle. And Seattle mm -hmm. was seven and nine and they won their division. In this game, it was the beast mode game, right? Because you got when you got to go on the road and you got to go into foreign territory, and the twelfth man, ah, and you can't hear, you know, you can't hear anything, and all of a sudden this guy rips one off, the crowd's going nuts, and <laughs> you know that's that's the way, that's the way it works. Now we've kind of lost our, we've kind of lost that mojo here of late. But to your point, like that home soil is a real thing. Yeah. Um, with the crowd we were they were missing some of their people for sure and, and so i was saying golf's the only sport where, where like we miss the opposing crowd like we wish they were there too because right. they add to the to the whole spectacle of it so it'll be interesting to see i want to transition that to the ladies game and i want to finish up the podcast with this i mentioned eight of the 11 in the men's game were americans eight of the top 30 on the lpga tour are americans official war golf rankings of course nelly corda just got bumped down to number two. Uh, Jin Young Koo, who just won the BMW, that's the 200th win by a South Korean player on the LPGA Tour um, just last week. So she's number one now. Mike Wan, who did a great job, LPGA Tour, moves on. He's running the USGA now, which I think is great. But you look at the LPGA Tour, and you think about some of these things that I just said, and you go down, Daniel Kang's 10, Lexi's 13, Jessica's, um, is is 18. Eight of the top 30 Americans. We know the South Koreans are dominant. What do you think of the LPGA Tour right now? They got two events left. Kind of give me the state of the ladies game, if you will, as uh, as you guys have broken it down there on the Golf Channel. Yeah, I think it's strong. I, I think Nelly has definitely given the American uh, ladies golf fan a, a huge boost. The, the storyline of the Americans, where are they? They're not winning enough. And she... Right wins their first major, becomes number one, wins Olympic gold medal, has this great story from this athletic family with her sister, her brother Seb, her parents. I mean, this is a, an incredibly talented family. That said, Jin Young Ko, much like she did in 2020, is closing so fast that she could like kind of, and she has right now, caught Nelly at the tape and passed her in, in terms of being world number one. And also she's out front. Uh, in the race for player of the year. They got the CME Globe and all these things still to play over these last couple of weeks in Florida. So 
I imagine Nelly and I talked to Nelly actually at, at Baltus Raw. We were there. I was hosting an outing and I was doing a and a with Nelly and and Jess. And Nelly's like, I, I you know, I got to finish strong. I got to, you know, it's been a, an emotional year, a lot of travel, mm. uh, the, the the eyeballs on her, the pressure on her. Now she's trying to finish the year strong, knowing that uh, Jin Young Ko has kind of stolen her thunder a little bit at the end of the year. But uh, to answer your question, this is great for the LPGA. Mm -hmm. uh, you have an American, you have a South Korean, different styles of players. You know, Nelly bombs it off the tee. You know, Jin Young Ko's in the 70s uh, in terms of distance off the tee, so they go about it differently. To me, a rivalry, though, is born when, when you're in a final group together mm -hmm. or if you're dueling for a major championship. So, you know, it was a couple years ago, it was Sung Hyun Park, it was looking like a dominant figure in the LPJ. She's been struggling. Jin Young Ko looks like she has some staying power. Nelly Korda clearly has some staying power. But it would be nice to see those two dueling maybe in Naples on that final weekend for you know kind of a slew of season-ending awards. Yep. It would be just fantastic for the LPGA. No, well, it's well said. It's uh yeah, it's all coming to uh, an end here in November. They got two events left. A little break right now, and then they got two week break and then they pick it up again pelicans and then they go down to naples uh for the final tournament so d hack good stuff it goes fast i know you're busy i know you got, just got done with your show Tariko's probably out there knocking on the door waiting to get in <laughs> i don't expect him to pick the seahawks tonight on tv as anyone but you never know we're two and four we got to get a win let's get it to three and four damon i appreciate you thanks for joining us here on the podcast man you're the best, Travis. Go Hawks. Best of the family. Let's do it again soon. All right, bye.